So you're a senior? Um, yeah, this is my fourth year, but uh, because I changed majors, I'm going to be taking a victory lap. Okay, you know? gotcha. Um, which I think is actually... I was upset about it at first, but then I thought about it from a business standpoint, and it's a whole nother year to build brand awareness for myself and connect with new people. Yep. So, silver linings, right? So, what are you uh, majoring in? Um, I'm majoring in interpersonal communication. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Yes. Okay. And this is uh, for my interviews class with uh, yep. Dr. Gokenauer. Okay, very good. So, well, first thing I'd like to uh, ask you about is what exactly is your role as director in the telecommunications department. I, I looked online and I saw that it's in charge of a cable TV. Uh, yeah, maybe that would be a good place to start. So we do deliver cable TV service both to um, the housing units as well as uh, uh, staff and academics. Okay. Um, we also provide all the voice services, so the telephone systems, we have 20 telephone systems that are interlinked together, both on and off campus. So we provide all the telephone service. We have our own, uh, one of the primary things we do is, I'm not sure how much you're familiar with IT, but layer one infrastructure, we mm -hmm. provide all of that. So all of the fiber optic cable, all the coax cable, all mm -hmm. the copper cable that's in the buildings for all the face plates, that's telecom's responsibility. So kind of without that, none of the network stuff would really work. We bring in cabling for the wireless access points, so anything to support all of that. Uh, the university uh, has a 1610 AM Travelers station. I don't know if you're familiar with it. AM radio? That you can listen to. Okay. And so we're responsible for maintaining that. All right. As a matter so of fact, there's the transmitter that blew up about two years ago. Oh, wow. And so that's that's on a pole outside of Whitehall, I think. Is that on is that on the village? Is that Whitehall? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have my glasses. My age, you need glasses. Uh, yeah, it's right outside of Whitehall. Hmm. Uh, so we're responsible for that. In addition to that, the university uh, owned... Um, has leased several frequencies from the FCC, and we have about eight different uh, two-way radio repeaters scattered out across campus, mm -hmm. um, and so we maintain those as well. Uh, the handhelds that the police department uses, facilities management, all of those kind of things. So that's that's kind of the surface of where we're at. There's other stuff that we do, but those are the primary ones. And so really my job as director the day-to-day -day operations of the department kind of fend for themselves. I mean, the, the department, we've had processes in place, and really my job as the director is to predict the future. No. So it's not that easy of a job. Technology is continuously changing. Right. Uh, the university decided a few years ago that we're going to put radio repeaters inside of buildings for public safety. And so now we're responsible for writing up the specifications for that. And so we've had to learn a lot about those kind of things. Um, so I work, I'm a member, a senior member of IT. Mm -hmm. I work with the other directors in IT uh, and try to help resolve problems that come up that are pertinent to telecom or in some area where we can assist. Telecom works very closely with the folks from uh, facilities management, uh, planning, um, capital and construction planning. So every time there's a building that's built, telecom is involved in that process because we have to bring up, put all the cabling. Yeah, in, you got to plug it in. All that kind of stuff. And so, you know, if I used SSC for example, if you took all the cabling that was installed in that building and stretched it out from end to end, it would run from here to just north of Martinsburg, West Virginia, along Route 81. Wow. So it's a, quite a bit of cable. <laughs> So I pretty much try to set the vision, predict where the technology is going to go, listen to what senior management is saying, listen to what the folks in academics are saying and how people figure out how they want to work, mm -hmm. and then try to devise a strategy that would put telecom in a position to help them do what they do right. as easily as or in the manner in which they want to do it. Cool. Um, so the, the radio transmitters that you're on putting on campus, are they mainly for JMU campus police or are there other uses so the, for it? So the ones that we have that are on campus are literally only for JMU personnel. Mm -hmm. um, the police department, one of the transmitters belongs to the police department. They're in the 450 
megahertz range. Mm -hmm. our, our police department recently transitioned to an 800 megahertz system that's part of the county's emergency communication system. This is a JMU police or is this Harrisonburg? JMU police. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, so you were talking about fiber optics and cables and such. When I was looking at the telecom website or mm -hmm. the web page on the JMU website, I couldn't find anything about internet providers. Like, did, are you in charge of the internet too? Because I usually think of cable as hand in hand with internet, which well, I'm so sure is incorrect. We, but the cable is the layer one. So there's there's a seven layer. It's called a seven layer OSI model for information technology. Mm -hmm. Cabling is layer number one, and everything else is built on top of that. So the folks who actually uh, we actually procure the service from Lumos, from the internet providers. Mm -hmm. um, the folks that actually manage that and do the routing and the switching and those kind of things are with Network Services, which is part of Dick Johnson's group next door in Massanutten Hall. And we work with them. We meet with them actually once a week. We have a standing meeting and we kind of work hand in hand. Okay, so you guys kind of lay the foundation for and then everything. They bring in the network stuff and plug it in on top of it. And we make sure that Everything is there so that it'll work when they plug it in. So without without you all, it just cease Every, to exist and just fail. Would, everything would kind of stop, yeah. All right, so I'd say you have a very important role then. We do. I mean, literally we do. And I think most people, when they think in terms of that, they don't think to the level of the cabling infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly Most didn't. people, they, you plug it into the wall and that's as far as it goes. Or nowadays, you simply connect wirelessly. And so most people don't even think about, when you think of connecting wirelessly, most people don't realize that behind that wireless access point is a wire. <laughs> is a wire. Absolutely. I had one of the folks that came in and interviewed me ask me, well, isn't wireless going to put you out of business? And it's, it's actually going to do the opposite. It's creating, <laughs> it's creating more business for us. So. Oh, right on. Um, another question in terms of like departmentally. You're, you're kind of the head honcho. I, I think, is there a director? I see your 101 room number. That's right. numero uno. Right. Um, what are some of the other responsibilities for people that are lower than you? Would you say that it's, it's mostly like over the phone communication or is it more face-to-face -face interaction and like hands-on wiring? Um, so it's a little bit of both. We have um, an assistant director for administration, mm -hmm. which is administering the office. And so that person is in charge of work control. So as work orders and tickets come in, we have a position known as work control. And they put, we have a, our own work control ticketing system. And they put in the tickets and they dispatch them to the engineers. And um, we have uh, five full-time engineers and three part-time engineers. And we have two on-site technicians from a company called Black Box that maintain the telephone systems. Okay. And so... That person manages the work control and the workflow. And then on the other side of that, we have a person that does billing that also reports to Susan Dean, who's the assistant director for administration. And so telecom is an auxiliary operation. I'm not for, you know, I'm, I don't know what you know about budgeting in the university, but you basically have ENG funded um, departments and then you have auxiliary funded departments. And then grants is a little different. Do you so, mind if I ask what ENG is? Uh, some uh, ENG. Well, of course, I'm going to draw a blank. <laughs> it's education in general. It's it's a general type fund. So okay. those are funds that basically are coming from the state or from revenue that JMU generates. Mm -hmm. And that's how those departments are funded. So telecom receives none of those funds. So we are more or less a standalone business. Oh. And so for every service that we perform, we bill the associated department requesting that service, and that's how we fund our operations. And so when it comes time to, for the universe to hand out a budget, or if something comes from Richmond, it, it really doesn't flow to telecom. It only flows to us as if we're performing a service and billing for it. And, okay. and so we used to have uh, telephones in the dorm rooms and student long distance would be billed and then cell phones kind of killed that off. And yeah. So the only phones that I'm aware of that we have in the dorm rooms now are we have some courtesy phones in the hallways and I think we have some emergency phones that are scattered around through there. Um, 
And so that's pretty much in-house. We also have a person that reports to me who is who manages that business system from a technical aspect and helps me do things around budget and runs budget reports and lets me know when I'm out of money or when I can spend money and, mm -hmm. and those kind of things and manage the office. Um, also located here, we have an infrastructure management person that reports to me. And what that is 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 a person who handles a system called MAPCOM. We purchased a, a product called M4 from a MAPCOM Systems in Richmond. And it allows us, so we have our own manhole system um, that runs on both sides of the campus. We have cable running underneath Duke Dog Tunnel. We have cable running underneath Carrier uh, Bridge going on Carrier Drive. Mm -hmm. We have an aerial run going across Black's Bridge that takes fiber service out to Memorial Hall. And so you have manholes associated with that. You have pool boxes, telephone poles, all of this infrastructure. And so the university's gotten so big, we didn't really know how many manholes we had. Because right. if you're not working in a certain area, uh, and so we, we wanted, we, we're now two years into a seven-year project to kind of, you know, to collect all that information and plot it in this mapping system. Mm -hmm. um, one, we just needed to know it, and then two, it'll bring us some efficiency. So our engineers are housed out at 1070 Virginia Avenue. Those folks, if I'm going out to work in a manhole, well, maybe it's been two years since we've had to open this manhole. Yeah. So we can, we can now collect information like, does the manhole have water in it? So we know that if we're going to go to that manhole, we can put a water pump on the truck when we come. Mm -hmm. What's the air quality in that? manhole so do we need to bring an air blower to make sure we've got circulation when the person's in the manhole mm -hmm. so we can you know if you without knowing that information the guys are typically going to drive from 1070 go out find the manhole um open it up say oh there's water let's go get a pump and now right so that's the back and forth just not efficient right so we're we're going to you know just from that alone we're going to get a lot of efficiencies out of that system we recently hired a part-time person um, that reports to me that we call the RF coordinator. And so he's responsible for making sure that all these FCC licensing for the radios um, are up to date and taken care of, designing the specifications, the building specifications around the public safety distributed antenna systems, anything to do with RF technology uh, from a telecom standpoint, not necessarily the wireless access points, but that's all kind of merging and converging at some point. So, um, so that's in-house. Uh, we have an, a second assistant director of, in charge of engineering. And so he has five full-time engineers and three part-time engineers. And that's where the rubber meets the road. These are the guys that are in the manholes, pulling the cable in the building, pulling the cable through the ceiling, mounting the wireless access points, and doing those kinds of things. OK, so how many people would you say are actively like employed by telecom what did you say around 15 so including myself we have a total of 18 people we have 12 full-time people and mm -hmm. six part-time people okay three of those people are the campus operators that work in this building they report to susan and they answer the university's main telephone line okay um it, it appears that you have a a lot of passion and knowledge about this subject so i guess a more personal question to ask is, what is it that drew you to this field? Have you always been involved in, in similar activities? So I, I've always been, I uh, joined the military out of high school, uh, was what was known as a ready omen and sat a radio circuit. It was basically a teletypewriter machine connected up to a transmitter, and that's how ships kind of talk to each other, mm -hmm. or did back then. Yeah. Uh, so it kind of got my feet wet from a technical standpoint, got out of the service, went to work for what's known as an integrator, or at that time they were called interconnect companies, that basically would sell a business telephone system. You know, that was when AT&T was breaking up and the, the government had said, you can't have this monopoly anymore. And so now you had all these small telephone companies. And so we would actually go out for the first time, a company could sell a, an individual business their own telephone system and so kind of got into doing that worked out in the field uh, as an installer for a number of years installing those systems servicing the systems uh, moved from that into project management uh, got a degree sometime back in early 2000 uh, in business administration 
did that for a while and then uh, I became the uh, operations manager for one of those companies. JMU was actually a client of ours um, and when the director retired, um, it was just a good fit. Um, it was to the point where in the private sector is much, much different than the public sector. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the benefits of working for JMU is you get a lot of time off. I mean, you know, we get virtually, we close for what, two weeks at Christmas and, you know, in the private sector, um, I got a day for Christmas. That was the 25th. That was it. You know, two days for Thanksgiving. Here this year, we got a week for that. So um, there were some benefits along those lines that um, it's basically what I was doing, um, just kind of in a smaller package. Here, I've got one customer even though there's many, many customers here. Literally every person on campus is my customer. Mm -hmm. But one area of central control for that, whereas out in the private sector, we literally would have thousands of customers. It's a lot of moving pieces. It's a lot of moving pieces to coordinate. Yeah, so. Um, well, uh... Didn't intend on becoming a telecom person. <laughs> Had no idea. I mean, just, it never would have entered my mind. I knew I wanted to you know, joined the military, mm -hmm. uh, went into the military intending to make it a career, uh, met a young lady, fell in love and realized that that wasn't going to work. And so um, got out and uh, realized I needed a job. And so I went to a trade school that kind of taught the telephone business. And there we yeah, and then it just all fell into place. So, so sometimes without planning, it does fall into place. Yes. Yeah, that's that's been my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you're not alone. Uh, what kind of training is required to work for JMU Telecom? Is there like a formal training process, or is it just like you have to have certain requirements upon an application? Um, we basically do our. We can are capable of doing our own training. Mm -hmm. So for an engineer that's out in the field to do the cable work, as a matter of fact, we have an ad out for one now. Uh, we're getting ready to hire an entry-level person. And so if you can write your name and, you know, uh, I think we have, if, if you can, you know, know which end of the hammer to pick up, we'll pretty much train you from the rest of the way. Um, there used to be trade schools that you could send people to, like I went to, that would actually teach you the color code, you know, the telephone wiring actually has a color code associated with it. Right. Um, and they would teach you how to do that and how to turn, do the different types of terminations, but uh, those are rare anymore. But we have a, a wealth of experience. We have some folks that have been with the university 30, 35 years and have been doing telecom a long time. And so we have the ability to do on-the-job training in terms of the layer one infrastructure stuff. Uh, working on a PBX, that gets a little bit more complicated. We typically, nowadays, we rely on a vendor for that, but we have sent our own people to the PBX schools as well um, with the vendor. Uh, from an administration standpoint, um, you know, a basic high school education, you could come in and learn uh, what you need to. I mean, most of the folks here, we've got two or three people that have like a business type degree. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the rest of them are OJT, learn that way. From an engineering standpoint, I'm not for sure we have anyone who is degreed on that side of the house. Okay, um, do you mind if I ask what, what OJT? On the mean? job training. On, okay, all right, that makes sense. Yep. Nice acronym there. Um, I'm gonna guess that by the sound of it, no JMU students are employed by your organization? Um, not. Full time, we we have an ad out right now, uh, and typically in the summertime we hire students mm -hmm. to come in and help us on the various construction projects, do everything from pull cable. We've had them in the manholes, uh, we've had them in crawl spaces under WVPT the, down here, um, and we basically have taught them how to ba do the basic rudimentary work of layer one. We also typically in the summertime have a student that goes around to every emergency phone on campus. So all the blue light phones, mm -hmm. all the phones in the stairwells where you just have to push a button and it rings down to the police department. 
we hire a student to test each and every one of those every single summer, as well as to walk through the dorms. As students move in and out of the housing units, they'll rip a jack off the wall, and so we go in and repair those and do those kind of things. Um, the last two years, uh, and in, I guess this will be three, we hire a student for our infrastructure management person. So they'll go out in the field with the GIS equipment and the GPS locating equipment, collect all the data about the manhole, uh, and then after the student goes back to school, then our infrastructure manager starts inputting all that data and, and those kind of things. The last, the student we picked up last summer actually worked with us through the fall all the way up until I think they left in the middle of January. They took a job with a, a government contractor in New Jersey, I think. So, okay. But from a full-time standpoint, we, we used to run the main switchboard with students, but uh, that was before I got here. They had made a switch. I, I think just with the, the workload that's on students nowadays, it was just difficult to, to have a person consistently come in when we needed to. And so we now staff that. We have three ladies who ironically were all school teachers and they've been retired. And so they kind of rotate um, coming in and answering the switchboard for us. Oh, huh. cool. Well, uh, that's all of the, the formal questions that I have prepared for you. I noticed the uh, fidget spinner on your desk. Do you have a hard time keeping still? Yes, I've been that way since I was a kid. If they had had those when I was a kid, I would have probably had a much simpler life. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would have probably got better grades in school, probably. So, yeah, well, yeah. I have... Um, so I, I have that problem as well. Like if I don't have like a pen to play with or something in my hand, like my leg will just shake oh. like crazy. Yep. And there's something that I've found a couple years ago that has helped me a lot. And I actually recently made the, the move to produce them under my, my company name. I don't know, have you ever heard of a Kendama before? I have not. Okay, so you've probably seen a, a simplified version of it before. It's a Japanese skill toy. Okay. It's a glorified ball in a cup. Okay. But the, the main essence is you want to just pop it up. Gotcha. And just move it from cup to cup and nice. try to spike it. And if this is something you think you'd be interested in, I'd be more than happy to just leave one here and yeah. let you play around with it because I have 200 yeah, of them. <laughs> yeah, so like I, I got plenty. And if you'd like it, it's it's... What are you selling those for? Uh, they're fifteen dollars. Fifteen a piece. Yeah, yeah. They're they're a ton of fun. I've been getting people on campus hyped up about it. And were you, yeah, I, I would probably like that personally, but to take it into a meeting, probably not. Oh yeah, um, no, I, I wouldn't recommend. It's a, it's very distracting neat. for for other people. Like, uh, whenever I play it on campus, a bunch of people will come up to me because I've been, I've been playing for five years, so okay. I'm very proficient with it. And Where do you have these? Do you have someone make them for you? I mean, yeah, I um, I went through a distributor or okay. a manufacturer in uh, Taiwan. Okay, and gotcha. I, I sent them colors and dimensions I of what I wanted. Seen it. That's pretty neat. Yeah, it's really cool, it's especially because it's a. Uh, when I came to JMU, so I got into the, involved with this toy in junior year of high school. Was it was a fad at my school, and I picked up on it at the very end, and everyone else stopped playing like right as I started. But I loved it so much that I was just like, "Oh, I'm gonna keep playing." How and much? I came to JMU wanting to start my own company. I was a business major initially. Right. Couldn't get the grades, so I, I switched over. But it it was really cool. I, I I fulfilled it before I even left school. It's just like this is what I came to do, and that's, and now that's, here it is. That's pretty neat. Um, I'll be more than happy to keep it here and share it around and. I can't make any promises that anybody will buy one. Oh no! I mean, I, I'm yeah, I'm letting just because I I like I like spreading the joy of kendama because oh, okay. it's, it's a very fulfilling thing. Okay. Uh, whenever you land a trick that you've been trying, because the fidget spinner it's it's like distracting, but, but it's not really fulfilling because you right. get the same thing it every just, time. Yeah, it just spins. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Of course. Well, appreciate that. Yeah, I think. Um, that's all I have prepared. Okay. And I'm just going to leave that there for you. Well, thank you. And I just wanted to uh, thank you very much for your time. You're